Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar, webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available for you to watch later at your convenience in our show archives. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for anyone here who's not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. So similar to your state library, um, so we provide training and resources and services and grants to all types of libraries in the state. So we will have shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries in, um, out there. Uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives. Uh, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Uh, we bring in guest speakers to Encompass Live sometimes, but sometimes we have our own Library Commission staff do presentations for us. And that is what we have today. Um, joining us this morning is Andrew Sherm Sherman, who is, um, well, right now the title is Library Tech Technology Support Specialist, IT guy, kind of. <laughs> um, and he's in our library development department here at the Library Commission. And Sherm is going to uh, tell us all you ever wanted to know about Wi-Fi in the library. No pressure. <laughs> Um, and if you have any questions too, as it said in the description, if you have questions, type them into the questions section. If you go to webinar interface, um, we'll grab them and Sharon can answer all of them. Um, we'll see what he, he may answer some of your questions as he goes through this presentation. Um, but if he doesn't, or if you just want to make sure he does get something covered, type it in when you think about it. We don't want you to miss out on getting any of your um, questions answered. So just type things in when you think about it. I'll keep an eye on it. And then um, We'll um, get you all your answers. So I will let you uh, take it away, Sherm. Tell us all about Wi-Fi in the library. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to, to do this program is there's a new Wi-Fi standard that actually just got approved on Monday. Oh, wow. uh, Wi-Fi yeah. 7 is coming, but we'll kind of walk through the uh, standards um, with our first slide. So this is the... Uh, Kind of the current generation of uh, Wi-Fi. So um, Wi-Fi 6 has been out for a while. Um, 6E was a stopgap because the 6 gigahertz uh, radio frequency came available and Wi-Fi 7 wasn't ready. Um, also as part of 6E Wi-Fi 7 they've introduced a new security standard too. So they're throwing quite a bit of stuff at us uh, for 2024. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it's a lot of new stuff. So there are some companies that have released 6E routers that they plan to upgrade to the Wi-Fi 7 standard once it was announced and finalized, which just happened on Monday. Uh, one of the issues you'll run into though with that gear is it's kind of that first mover price. Um, they tend to be the high-end, pretty expensive gear. Um, you know, if it's a large library, maybe. If it's a small library where really a consumer grade router uh, meets your needs, I don't know that it's worth spending, you know, $500, $600, $700 on a Wi Fi 7 router, even for the future proofing it might give you. It just depends on the funds that are available to you. Um, the Wi Fi 6E Wi Fi standard. Uh, why the, everybody's so excited about them is they offer significantly faster. Um, wireless connections. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to stay ahead of the internet speeds that are available now to um, businesses and consumers. Um, right now nationally I think the average internet speed for a home is 200 um, megabits per second which seems would be a luxury I think for some of our uh, communities and libraries in Nebraska. Um, mm -hmm. I just finally got one gig service um, in Omaha, which is fiber. And I, I really enjoy it. It's really, really nice. Uh, and currently I have like an iPhone 14. 
Um, I bought a new computer last year, so I don't have anything that can take advantage of 6E or 7 at home yet. I don't have any devices that can use that bandwidth and speed, so I haven't upgraded my my home router setup. I'm still running one that follows the uh, Wi-Fi 5 standard, the 802.11ac. Um, we do have some funding that's available at the Nebraska Library Commission uh, for libraries that if they want to upgrade their network equipment and need some assistance with that, um, we can definitely help. Are you going to explain more about that later too? Yep. Uh, we, we, I, I wasn't sure. I've been away for a little while. <laughs> out for I didn't know if we had all that, all the details of that figured out now. Yeah, we're still working on it a little bit, okay. but I, I will mention it. So. Awesome. The library network right now, you should at least have a router that's supporting Wi-Fi 5, the 802.11 AC standard. Um, it offers both the 2.4 and the 5 gig um, radio frequencies. So what you see in a lot of places where you go to, if you bring your device up to join the Wi-Fi network, you'll see there's a, a Wi-Fi network declared at two or 2.4 gig in the in the name of the network and maybe one at five. And that's kind of how things have worked in the past. You pick the one you want to get on. Um, five is going to be fast. Um, 2.4 is going to give you a better range in what we call barrier penetration. So if you're in a you know a large building, um, if you're in the room where maybe there there are Wi-Fi router or access point is you can connect at five and it works really fast if you're in maybe one of the meeting rooms in the building or outside you maybe see both networks but you see a lot better reception bars for the 2.4 that's the reason why and that's why they keep using the 2.4 gigahertz uh, radio frequencies it provides much much better range and much much better penetration through the walls and things um, I will mention that your wired network should at least be providing a, a thousand megabit per second or one gig connections. That's kind of the current wired standard. And for example, with the current um, fiber, a lot of the fiber now offering one gig, that kind of puts your home network on parity with the speed of the internet service that you have. Um, when we talk about Wi-Fi network names, that's called the SID, the Service Set Identifier. So that's the name of the network. So if you go into your router, when you set up your Wi-Fi, you give it the names of the networks. So if it's the name of the library or maybe the initials of the library, so if it's like um, Lincoln Public Library, maybe it's LPL, um, and then 2.4, and then maybe LPL5, uh, so that those two different Wi-Fi frequencies are available with a SID, so you know which one you're connecting to. Um, what's new with 6E and 7 is these new routers have the ability to blend all those frequencies, so they just appear as a single SID or network name. So it would be just LPL, and what the new standards do is your device has the ability to connect to whichever network seems best to it at the time, and it has the ability to basically switch back and forth between the frequencies for whatever it calculates is giving the best connection and the best performance. Um, so unfortunately, that creates a little bit of an issue. So if you have the new iPhone 15s, the new Pixels, you just bought a brand new laptop or desktop computer that has uh, a Wi-Fi, um, a new tablet, um, they have the, they actually prefer to have that single SID configuration that allows them to f flex between um, which Wi-Fi network is the best. Um, and our old devices, our older devices, like I said, I have an iPhone 14, don't do that. Once you connect to either the 5 or the 2.4, it just stays on that. You kind of pick what you want. So it's going to be interesting to see how um, the new routers are going to support that. Uh, you throw in the new security standard, WAP3, which they've made a requirement to use the 6 gigahertz standard uh, because they know people are going to want the faster speeds and they want to get people to adapt the new security standard. So the, they made, a, they made a, a rule on the 6E7 standards 
that if you're going to use a six gigahertz connection, you have to use WAP3 security. Unfortunately, a lot of our devices don't support WAP3 yet. Um, again, you have to have the current generation device to have the ability to use that six gigahertz radio frequency in the WAP3 standard. So again, it's up to the router providers to come up with a way for their um, router to support not only you know that mixed frequency environment, but as well what's going to be a mixed uh, security standard uh, for a little while too. Uh, the other big advantage about having a newer router in your library is over time, what they've done is as these routers have become more powerful, they've added what we call um, um, MIMOs, more MIMOs to the box. What they did is they add multiple receivers, transmitters into one box. In the old days, your router had a processor, one transmitter, one receiver. To improve performance and support multiple devices, they've been able to boost that number. So that's a significant gain you get with a new router is you get the boxes that have these um, uh, multiple MIMOs that give you much, much better service, uh, not only faster speeds, but can support many more devices at a time at a high rate of speed too. So again, if we look you know, on the page here, the current route, the router in your library should be doing 8211 80 AC at a minimum. Um, if you're looking for a new router, I really recommend, you know, considering between the Wi-Fi 6, the Wi-Fi 6E, 7 was just announced, you know, if you want to hold off a little bit, and maybe wait for those prices to come down on the routers and Wi-Fi gear um, to get to 7, but there's just not a lot of devices out there yet that'll take advantage of it. So you could easily upgrade to a Wi-Fi 6 router at a very low cost. Um, and be getting all the benefit of everything but that six gigahertz um, radio frequency. So now this is the part we'll probably spend a little bit of time on. It's really is how good is the Wi-Fi radio signal in your building? And there's a number of ways we can look at this. Um, so on your smartphone, um, you can kind of walk through the library, see how things change, figure out where your signal's strong, where your signal's weak. Um, if you have an iPhone, one of the bad things about the iPhone, so I have a, a sample to the right there on the screen. That's my uh, Wi-Fi settings on my iPhone. And I can see um, the Wi-Fi networks and I can see the, the bars mm -hmm. and that little fan shape. I can see how strong the reception is to it, uh, but I don't, unfortunately the Wi-Fi, if you click onto that I with the little circle, the information, they don't show you the frequency or link speed, which is, I don't know why they don't do it. It's kind of a, a pain in the butt. I guess they figure most people don't care. They got a Wi-Fi connection and it works, are good to go. So you see on my screen, I'm connected. My home Wi-Fi network is called Sherm Units. I have a newer um, Orbi mesh, Wi-Fi set up at my home and it does that blended um, network. So even though I have a network out there that says Sherm units, um, my iPhone is actually picking whether to do 2.4 or five gigahertz radio connection. And unfortunately, I can't see which one it's selected and using the way kind of the new standards work. Um, Older routers, you know, we would set it up where you would see a 2.4 network and a 5 network. And if you're an informed user, you're like, well, I've got good signal on the 5. I'm going to pick that because that's going to give me better speed than the 2.4. So this is kind of one of the interesting things with how they're they're switching to this kind of unified um, SID network name that's going to allow your device to float between the frequencies uh, to get the best possible performance. Uh, if you have an Android phone, you can go to your settings, network and internet, scroll down to network details, and it will show you which frequency you're connected to and what the link speed is. That's how many megabits per second you're getting for throughput. On a Windows PC, uh, you can right click. So if you see those icons here on the screen, this will show you whether you're connected by cable or by Wi-Fi. You can right click on that, open network and settings, go to the properties. And again, you can see what window calls your protocol, which would be the Wi-Fi uh, frequency you're connected to and your link speeds. So 
this kind of gives you the ability to, to see how good your performance is. So you have a laptop, you could go to different parts of the library. If you have your phone, you could just bring up that, uh, like on my iPhone, you can, I just bring up my setting screen, I can walk around and I can see those um, bars of reception go up and down. Or what you may see is you may see the Wi-Fi network um, just completely drop off because it can't see it anymore. Um, you can see I pick up my neighbor's uh, Wi-Fi networks too. Depending where your library is located, you may see the library's network, you may see maybe the coffee shop next to you or across the street. As Wi-Fi signals have gotten stronger, you know, we see more stuff out there like that. Um, if you want to do a speed test, and this is something we request as part of the um, survey we do every year, you can do a Google speed test, and the speed test by Ookla is pretty much what everybody uh, uses kind of as a standard. And you want to perform that test on a wired network connection. That'll show you your true, true speed to your network connection. Now, if, if you've got a newer router and you know your Wi-Fi uh, speed is greater than what you're paying for internet, you could do it on a Wi-Fi device and get a realistic speed, but um, wired speed, if you've got a current wired network, like on the previous screen we talked about, you should be running at 1,000 megabits per second or one gig. Um, do your speed test there, and you should get the numbers for you know, what's working best. Mm -hmm. And also what we're seeing now with the move from DSL and cable to fiber, is it brings up the kind of conversation of asynchronous and synchronous speeds. So in the past, we're used to asynchronous service with our DSL and our cable internet service. So what that is, is they prioritize download speed over upload speed to make their networks perform better. So if you run a speed test, you get two numbers. You get what your download speed is and you get your upload speed is. And historically, it's traditionally been, let's say your download speed is 100 megabits, um, per second, generally you're um, you're on an asynchronous connection, then your upload speed would be somewhere usually around 25% of that. So if it was 100 megabit down, it'd be around 25 megabit per second up. And in the past, when all we did from the internet was just draw stuff down, that worked really great. But now that videos become such a big part of the internet, um, mm -hmm. if you're doing video conferencing, if you're doing telemedicine, um, telehealth, things like that, um, you may notice where if you're on a, um, a video chat and you have mem people that are participating and you see their video lagging or you, their voice is dropping out or their lips don't match the audio as they're speaking, that's where you see that reduced um, upload speed is coming into play. Mm -hmm. uh, with new fiber technology coming on, those are moving to what we call synchronous connection. So your download is just as fast, um, your upload is just as fast as your download. So for example, um, the new one gigahertz fiber connection I have at my house, I'm one gig down and I'm one gig up. I can put video up for my web camera just as fast as the video comes down from the webinar and stuff I'm connected to. So that's gonna be kind of the, the new world too as we see more and more people get fiber connected uh, with the better performance we get. Yeah, it's very different what you see when we're trying to get libraries um, new internet, new fiber that it used to be, you know, they would offer 100 slash 10 and now it's all 100 slash 100. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's, there's yeah. still providers doing that. Um, we have some, we've had some libraries that have moved to fiber and obviously gotten much faster um, download, but some of the vendors are doing kind of a, a unique fiber solution where they're still to protect their network and, and keep their networks running as fast as possible. They're still limiting upload. Uh, so even with a fiber connection, you could be um, in an asynchronous situation. That should go away over time. And generally, because you've got a much faster download speed, you did pick up a much faster upload speed too, even though it may not still be running in what we call synchronous mode where they're the same. Um, but you're still at the advantage of having much faster speed, both for your download and your upload. So again, looking at the, you know, the Wi-Fi signal in the building, 
um, what is it dependent on? Um, and it's really dependent on the size and the floor plan of the library. A lot of the libraries I work with where we're running down weak Wi-Fi signal, uh, it tends to be, the issue tends to be is where their Wi-Fi um, router is housed. Um, a lot of times we've traditionally just had it, so wherever the our internet and phone provider, wherever that service enters the building, we usually have a little closet with a shelf that's called the DMARC, the demarcation point, where they hand that phone and internet off to the building. And that tends to be where the Wi-Fi router is. And in a lot of buildings, that means it's in a closet, like next to the plumbing or something like that. And so if you're sitting out in the front of the library or maybe even in a parking spot in front of the library, the router is as far away as it can be. And if it's in a closet where it's got the door shut and things like that, that causes degradation in that signal strength. So something to think about is, you know, if you're a library that has some the Ethernet cabling in place, you know, can we do some stuff where that Wi-Fi router can be located in the middle of the building, you know, out in your open area? So if you have people that can take advantage of the five gig uh, radio frequency, they've got line of sight, um, close proximity to that router, so they're getting as good a service as possible. Where we I see in a lot of libraries. If the library has an addition or maybe their meeting rooms in the basement, um, you'll see really poor uh, signal down there again because of where the router is located. And this can be on what are the materials that the building is built out of that are um, impeding that signal. So a lot of times when you're talking like the Wi-Fi routers on the first floor and you have somebody in the basement or maybe on a second floor, those floors are built to be um, have what we call firewall or fire barrier into. So if you have a fire, it can't spread easily. Those tend to really block Wi-Fi signal. Um, brick, concrete, plaster all block the signal more than drywall does. Um, so if your building has an addition, um, that can make a big difference. A good example of this is my library in Sydney where I was a director. Um, we had a bookmobile, we have a bookmobile, and we had a garage on the end of the library. And initially when the building was built, that garage was a drive-through. So you would come in one end of the library and then drive through the other. Well, they they whacked half of the garage space off and turned it into a meeting room, which was great. But because that was originally the garage for the bookmobile, when you have a vehicle parked in a building, you have to have fire rated walls between the garage and rest of the building. So if you would have a vehicle fire or something, it makes it hard for that fire to spread to rest of the building. So we couldn't get any Wi-Fi signal in our, our meeting room at all or where we parked the bookmobile. Um, hmm. The fix to that was to put a wireless access point in the garage where the bookmobile was at and put one in the meeting room so we were serving good Wi-Fi signals in those spaces. Again, like we talked about on the previous screen, if you bring up your phone, you bring up your Wi-Fi networks and walk through the building, you can see that signal strength. You could see maybe your network names drop on and off um, as you're walking through the building. This allows you to very easily test your Wi-Fi signal. Um, back in the old days, before we had the smartphones that had this capability, um, there were a lot of your cabling or electrical companies, they would come in and do what we call a wire audit, where they would um, come in and they had a device that could measure the Wi-Fi signals through your building and find the dead zones and then help plan out how you would wire uh, the network for wireless access points through the building to make sure the whole building had good Wi-Fi signal. Um, another thing to think about is, you know, the Wi-Fi signal, if it's good indoors, um, what about the outdoors? For example, at Sydney, we had such a fast internet connection and such good Wi-Fi is, um, I joked about us being the drive-by Wi-Fi for the community. Uh, we had a lot of smaller villages outside of Sydney that had terrible internet service. So we would have folks um, pull up in front of the library maybe before they were going to work and they would connect to our Wi-Fi network. We had delivery people. They would park their truck in front of the library and get up to date on their delivery route and stuff. We had salespeople who would stop and park in front of the car and be able to use their 
uh, our, our nice Wi-Fi signal and internet connection to update their information or send emails or things like that. So something to think about, you know, do you want that Wi-Fi signal to reach some outdoor spaces? Um, if you do, again, do we want to think about having the Wi-Fi router maybe towards the front of the building so we're extending that signal nice and strong over those parking spots? Or does the library have a little garden area or something where maybe positioning that or doing an outdoor rated wireless access point gives us good signal through that area? So there's a lot of things to consider there. The nice thing is with your phone and you know the ability to, if you have the cabling to move that route around the, uh, the building, we can do a lot of kind of testing best case and figure out where our best positioning and all that can be. And it's not very difficult to do at all. So how to improve the Wi-Fi? Um, again, we talked about, you know, can the Wi-Fi router be placed in the center or the kind of the primo location the library that gives us the signal in the area, best signal we can get in the areas we want. Um, some of the libraries I've been working with um, since I came aboard, I've seen some really, really old routers. I mean, just 10 years old, 15 years old, that are way behind the times, super slow and, just getting a, a modern router that supports the current standards and has those multiple antennas and receivers and better range can make a huge difference. And we're talking, you know, you can pick up a uh, entry level consumer grade Wi-Fi 6 router, 60, 70 bucks is all you have to spend. And if you're replacing a decade old Wi-Fi router, you're going to see substantial improvements in range and speed. But the things we want to look at again is how large is the library. A lot of the routers or mesh nets works. They they will tell you how many square feet they're built to cover. So you know just the router itself may be what they call apartment um, signal strength, where it's meant to just cover maybe 15,000, 1,500 square feet. Um, some of your mesh networks, if you go to um, two or three device mesh networks. They'll say large house, which can cover 6,000 to 8,000 square feet. Um, businesses generally use what we refer to as WAPs, wireless access points, where they've actually run ethernet cable to the locations of where they want these WAPs. And it creates a big one building mesh network that gives wife, good Wi-Fi service throughout the whole building. And when we're talking about a mesh network, um, what we're talking about is a unified Wi-Fi network. So in the old days, like what I had to first do in Sydney is we had a Wi-Fi router um, that we ran some wire out so we could have it right behind the front desk in the main part of the library. And that Wi-Fi router served Wi-Fi throughout the main library area and the parking spots in front of the library. Because we had that fire barrier between the garage space in our meeting room and our um, bookmobile garage we had what we did is we put our best newest Wi-Fi router in the main library and then our old Wi-Fi router um, we put into what was called wireless access mode where it didn't do anything but offer Wi-Fi and we put that old Wi-Fi router in between our bookmobile garage and our meeting room and that's how we served Wi-Fi to that area the bad thing was is if you were in the main library you'd be connected to the Wi-Fi network in there. If you moved to the meeting room, that connection would drop out and you would have to connect to the network we had in there, which was SPL meeting room. Mm -hmm. And it, your device couldn't float between the two. You had to pick the one you wanted to be on. So if you walked back out of the meeting room and that, you know, we had that fire barrier because it used to be a garage, that network would would get really slow or quit working you had to connect back manually then to the main network um, some of the devices now you know you can say, say to automatically connect and if it sees a big drop from one network to the other it'll make the switch for you but it, it was kind of a pain in the butt so what the mesh networks do is they make it look like one complete Wi-Fi network. You don't have to worry that you've gone from this end of the building to this end of the building because the devices that make up the NESH, they hand you off from device to device when this device starts performing better than the device you were on. And the mesh stuff has gotten fairly affordable too. 
Um, the Orbi I have at home when I first bought that was one of the early mesh uh, devices available. It was expensive, but um, I had a house that had plaster walls and I had to have something like that to be able to get what good Wi-Fi signal throughout my house. When you set those mesh networks up, um, there's you have what we call backhaul um, between the devices. So what a lot of homeowners do is they do what's called the wireless backhaul. So if you look at the two little pictures I have down here in the corner, where we have main deco and other deco, that dotted line signifies that we're using a wired backhaul, which is an ethernet cable from the main Wi-Fi router to the satellite, we're using a wired connection between those devices to communicate. And that's the best way to do it. So if your library has some existing cabling that we can take advantage of, um, doing that wired backhaul between, from your main router to the satellites or the WAPs gives you really, really good connection between the devices. So then all I have to do is serve the Wi-Fi to the devices that are in range of them. If you're on you know, the second floor or the basement, and then they're taking that wired connection and dumping it, that wireless connection, and then dumping it to a wired connection back to your main modem router and your internet. Gives really, really good performance. Um, people can move throughout the building with their wireless device and they get handed off from device to device and they never see any degradation in performance or anything. Now, unfortunately, a lot of homes, um, unless they were recently built and somebody had it wired with ethernet all through the house, um, you don't have those Ethernet cables to do, or you know, you're in a an older library or something. Those cables may not be run that are going to let you do that wired backhaul. So what a lot of these satellite units also have the ability to do is what we call a wireless backhaul. So what they do is they actually they look and see, okay, I'm the satellite unit. I'm talking to the main router, and they will look at that Wi-Fi connection and they will actually carve out a piece of it and reserve it for the backhaul traffic. So you are paying a little bit of performance hit because it's using part of that Wi-Fi performance to carve out and do the backhaul connection. So it's not being able to make that available to your devices, but it allows you to have that mesh network in place without the cost, trouble or expense of having to have ethernet cables run uh, between your WAPs, your satellite units. So the one gotcha there is if you've got a really weak area in your library, you can't just drop a satellite in that area because it won't really help. Devices in an area will see the satellite and it looks like they have a good Wi-Fi connection, but that backhaul is problematic because it's a weak Wi-Fi connection from the satellite back to the main router, and that'll again cause the performance to be poor. So what you want to do is when you place those um, wireless backhauled satellites out, you want to make sure they still have a pretty good Wi-Fi connection back to the main router. And what you can do is you can buy those devices, you can buy them in sets of two, um, sets of three, and what you can do is you can space them through the building so they're kind of acting as what we call a repeater. So you go from, let's say you're, your main router for your mesh setup is is unfortunately maybe in a closet in a workspace or it's in the office behind the front desk. You put your first satellite out in the part of the library where it's still got a really good Wi-Fi connection back to that router. And then your next satellite can be placed out where it's still got a good Wi-Fi connection back to satellite number one. And you can kind of use that to extend um, that Wi-Fi network out and still maintain a good wireless backhaul. Again, it can take a lot of experimentation to kind of know where to place those and get the best performance with the devices you've bought. Um, it's probably, um, you know, recommended what you're doing. We could, there's some things we can take care of, advantage of and funding I'll talk to you in a little bit, where if we need to maybe have some electrician come in and run some cabling, there's some, some funds available that can assist with that. What a lot of businesses now is they use the wireless access points. Um, if you look at that top picture where they've got these a cable run and a lot of times these are mounted on the ceiling 
in the center of the area or the room that they're serving the Wi-Fi for, wi for. And what's nice about the WAPs is you can have as many of them as you need. Um, some of the consumer grade mesh products only allow you to hook up like two or three satellites and then that's the most they can support because they're more of a consumer grade setup for a house. Um, just want to make you aware that the router, um, most of your modern day routers have additional ethernet ports on them so they can also function as a small switch. Um, if you have a library where you just don't have enough items that you need an ethernet switch to plug everything into and your router's got enough free ports, you can utilize that as a switch. And one thing to think about is um, one of the challenges I faced at a couple of my libraries is the ethernet cabling we had was old. Um, it, one library was cat, a mix of cat three and cat five. Uh, another library was cat five. Unfortunately, those old wiring standards, um, cat three can't run any faster than 10 megabit per second. Cat five can't run any faster than 100 megabit per second. So we would have had to rewire the building to get to um, 5e one gig wiring speed. And what we chose to do was to use Wi-Fi to give us the performance we wanted and not have to spend money on new cabling. The other nice thing about that was like in my Sydney library is we had these ugly cabling poles that came out of the ceiling and were placed wherever computers were at. So when you walked in the library, you know, we kind of had this beautiful open library and then there was this beige cabling pole here, beige cabling pole there, beige cabling pole over here. And what was nice is when we migrated that whole network to wireless, um, we were able to take all those poles down and it just made the library look just so much better, so much nicer. And what you can do if you have older PCs and, you know, you don't really need to replace them, but you'd like to take advantage of maybe you bought, you buy a new uh, 6E7 router, you can upgrade, you can add Wi-Fi cards to like your desktop PCs, or if you have laptops, um, you can add a, uh, you know, a Wi-Fi adapter that uses the USB port or something and take advantage of faster Wi-Fi performance for your computers in the library. And they're very, tend to be very inexpensive. Um, I have one old desktop PC I still use at home, uh, mostly some, somewhere to help archive and be a backup storage for photos and video and stuff. And the PC runs great, um, but it, the, the built-in Wi-Fi on it is old and only supports a 2.4 megahertz, uh, 2.4 gig network connection. So I put a new Wi-Fi card in it that supported five gig and it runs really, really fast now. So it can talk to my other computers on my network plenty fast and I can upload files and video backups to it uh, very, very quickly and it works really good. So that's something to think about. You could upgrade the Wi-Fi um, in your desktop PCs and things like that to take advantage of the five gig, the six gig speed and be able to bypass that older, not so great cabling that you have in place. So talking about funding, um, if you're an E-rate library or you wanna be an E-rate library, category two E-rate pays for network gear and cabling. So if you wanna get a new router, you wanna get a new switch, um, you wanna get WAPs, you need to um, have new ethernet cabling put in to be the back call uh, between your, your Wi-Fi access points and stuff. Category two E-rate will help pay for that at whatever discount the library qualifies for. Um, in Nebraska, Krista, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we average 70% for our libraries. Um, 60 this most recent year, I think it was 74 was the actual um i can actually find out sometimes we, actually it's gone up a little so between 73 and 74 percent is the average uh for our um public libraries yeah so let's say you decide you want to hey if we're going to do the wi-fi upgrade let's go with seven so we're going to pay 500 ducks uh, you know for a uh, a wi-fi 7 router or we're going to pay a thousand bucks for a wi-fi 7 mesh system uh, if you're doing e-rate you can apply uh, and get 
whatever percentage your library is making. So if it's 70%, 70% yeah. of that cost can be covered by E-rate. Um, the Nebraska Library Commission also has library improvement grants. Um, mm -hmm. It can be used for that. I believe they have the 25% match, correct, Chris? Yeah, for, uh, yeah. So, so for E-rate, I just looked it up. For E-rate in 2023, the average was 73%. Um, yeah. of e-rate discounts in for Nebraska public libraries. Um, so 60, 70, 80% is where that usually goes. Um, for library improvement grants, um, yeah, you need to provide 25% of the total project cost. So um, whatever it costs, um, you know, we'll pay 75% of the total cost for everything and then you would have to cover 25% of it um, if, you, if you went that route. Yeah, and that can be used for new computers also, right? Yep. Yes, yeah. yes. E-rate is only for your internet service right. and then the equipment that helps make the network, makes the internet work, your networking equipment, not for actual PCs or tablets or the devices, um, but library right. improvement grants you could then use, or other grants that are out there as well, not just our library improvement grants, but our grants to the commission you could use to um, buy and upgrade your actual PCs, your computers or tablets or laptops or things. Yep. Yep. So there's a, a lot of funding assistance out there that can make this. And again, if you're a, a small um, library that can get by on a consumer grade router or consumer grade mesh, um, a Wi-Fi 6 router, um, you can pick a nice one up these days for 60 to 75 bucks. Um, a a, a Wi-Fi 6 mesh system, they tend to run about two or $300. So we're not talking a lot of money. And um, if, if that would still be a struggle for your library, definitely uh, contact Chris and I and see if we can help you, you know, come up with the funding to make mm -hmm. that happen. Um, so There's lots of options, yeah, lots of ways yeah, to go. Because <laughs> yeah. I just can't tell you, I, you know, I run into these, I go into these libraries, I'm helping out and, you know, 10 year old, 15 year old Wi-Fi router. So not only is the performance terrible, but a lot of times a device that old is what we call end of life, where the manufacturer no longer supports the device, which mm -hmm. means they're not providing uh, software firmware upgrades for it, which means they're not providing security fixes for it. So it's just like Windows where Microsoft retired Windows 7, they're no longer providing any security. So anytime a hacker discovers a new security flaw, if you're running old, old stuff, they can take advantage of it because the manufacturer or the software um, firm is not even providing any updates anymore to plug those holes. So that's the other thing to keep in mind when you've got really, really old stuff in use is you're probably looking at, could very well be looking at some se severe security vulnerabilities too because it's so out of date. So here's what we're talking about. So if you look at that picture, new Wi-Fi router, this is a model that I really like from TP-Link. Um, but if you look at the back where we see those ports, so that blue port, that's where your internet connection comes in. We refer to that as the WAN port. And then the orange connections are just ethernet connections. So this would be where um, it's just a little ethernet switch. So a lot of times what you see in the libraries, you see the, the WAN connection comes off the modem uh, from the ISP plugs into that WAN port and then they may have just one cable plugged in to one of the orange ports and the, then that cable may run out into their main library where they have a little ethernet switch that all their public computers are connected to and then they may have another cable that runs out to maybe the front desk where they have a couple computers at. So if, if you're a small library and you don't have a lot of devices connect and you have an old switch, one thing to think about is if the Wi-Fi router you upgrade to has enough Ethernet ports on it, you may not need to worry about upgrading the switch that goes with it. Um, to the right, there's an example of the mesh Wi-Fi kit where you've got one of those as your main router and then the others are satellites to it that spreads that Wi-Fi network out. Um, down below is what we refer to as the WAP. Uh, these are the you by a company called Ubiquity. They're super popular. I see these all over the place. Um, these are made to mount on ceilings with an Ethernet cable run to them. And they use a technology we call PoE, Power Over Ethernet. So not only is that Ethernet connection connected back to the router, um, but um, somewhere in there we have a PoE setup. So maybe it's hooked back to a switch 
with PoE ports or an injector. So what you do is you hook your Ethernet uh, cable into that PoE, has a power supply, there's another port that comes out, and it, you're actually supplying the power to that WAP over the Ethernet connection. So you don't have to have electrical connections in the ceiling. In the old days with WAPs, you did. You would have to not only have an eth a network connection run to that spot in the ceiling, you'd have to have a power uh, feed also at that spot in the ceiling. And the WAPs would plug into the ethernet connection and then have a power supply that would have to plug into a power outlet. With the power over ethernet, those days are gone. All you have to do is pull an ethernet cable and you can use it for both the network connection and the power connection. And in new construction, that's what they're doing it. Um, if you've got a new phone system that's voice over IP, um, those phones can use the power over ethernet. So again, anywhere you have an ethernet connection, you can drop a handset for your phone and you don't have to have power. It's powered by the ethernet cable. Um, this is super popular now also with security cameras. So, you know, the days of the old CCTV coax cable security cameras, and then everywhere you have a security camera, you have to have a power connection run to it. Those days are gone. A lot of these security cameras now are have taken advantage of power over Ethernet. So that Ethernet connection that runs through security camera that feeds the video back to your um, security cameras um, base station um, also is providing the power to that security camera. So it makes them much more flexible, uh, much cheaper to install. And so one thing you need to be aware of if you're looking at doing power over Ethernet is different devices draw different power levels. So a WAP doesn't draw much power, but a security camera or phone can. So what you'll see when you go to buy a PoE injector or a PoE switch is their ports have a power rating of how much power that port can provide and what distance that ethernet cable can be uh, for it to successfully deliver that power and network connection. So um, if you have low power um, PoE devices, you can buy a, a, least, a less expensive switch that has lower power PoE ports. If you have high power devices like security cameras, you'll need to have a switch that can deliver enough power uh, to power that security camera. And that's all documented, uh, you know, in what you're purchasing, purchasing and what you need to do. But we've kind of got away from where your phone system used the phone cables and it was an independent system. Your security camera system used um, coax cables and it was an independent system. And then your data network, now it's all been unified to use that wired ethernet data network to run everything. Run your computers, run your access points, run your security cameras, run your phones. Um, it's all done on one system now. And, it's, and the prices have come down considerably. Um, it's a very, very affordable setup. If you're you know, doing a big remodel or new construction, you should definitely want to look at taking advantage over that power over ethernet technology to have a good Wi-Fi network, have super phone service, um, have good security camera setups. Uh, it just works fantastic and it's a great, great technology platform. So now we're going to talk about accessing the Wi-Fi network and this is definitely something that is really what works best for your library and your community. Uh, so the big question I get a lot is, um, should we have a Wi-Fi password set on our network? And um, in the past, the reason you would want to do that is if you have a password to connect to the Wi-Fi network, that also encrypts that connection. So you connect to the Wi-Fi, connect the password, that Wi-Fi connection is encrypted. People can't see it. It doesn't run what we call in the clear, where somebody with a packet sniffer could capture the packets and put them together and see what you're doing or capture that data or whatever. It's mm -hmm. encrypted. So security people all used to always recommend put a password on your Wi-Fi network. Um, don't use public Wi-Fi that don't have a password on them because your stuff's in the clear. And if there's somebody sitting there with a a packet sniffer, um, they can collect the packets from your device and they can use it to figure out 
you know, what you're doing, passwords, things like that. Yeah. Those days have kind of gone by the wayside, depending on what we're doing, and we'll get into that in a little bit. I'm not a fan of Wi-Fi passwords, even as strong as I am on security, just because it hinders and limits the use so much. Um, if you have people that are outside of the library and want to use the Wi-Fi network and it's outside your hours and you're not open, they can't come in and ask you for the Wi-Fi password. It blocks and limits you. So I was never a fan of doing that. And there's some options available to, to, to really allow that and make that work. Um, one thing that's come up, if you use the internet a lot, you know the days that used to be just HTTP and then the URL for the website. Now we have HTTPS, which is secure. So when you connect to a website that's utilizing HTTP, HTTPS, which is pretty much all the websites now, it's definitely financial, email, things like that. Once you connect to that website, that connection becomes encrypted with HTTPS. So again, it kind of really gets rid of one of the big issues for that open, no password Wi-Fi network. Because um, that connection to that bank website or that email website is now encrypted because you're using HTTPS. So in my setups that I've done, we use secure Wi-Fi just for the staff use. And that gives you some adva other advantages like um, quality of service. Uh, you can make sure that staff use of the Wi-Fi network gets higher priority than the public's use. So if you're using Wi-Fi and computers to connect to the catalog, the ILS and things like that, you can say these devices get the um, bigger chunk of the bandwidth, um, higher priority to do their stuff over the devices the public's connecting to the Wi-Fi network. Um, some libraries, they change their pat Wi-Fi password regularly just so um, it kind of limits the use. Um, if you're in a library in a small town where you've got homes or maybe apartment buildings right next to the library and you've got a good Wi-Fi network, uh, you may have people using the library's Wi-Fi network so they don't have to have their own Wi-Fi, their own internet service at home. Um, there's some libraries that see this issue. They change their Wi-Fi password on a regular basis to kind of combat that. You know, that person can come over to the library, hey, what's the Wi-Fi password? Go home and they're back in business again. Um, the other thing that Wi-Fi routers have been able to do for a long, long time is enable the guest network. So a lot of times you walk into a business, a coffee shop, a library, and when you look at the available Wi-Fi networks, you'll see like LPL staff 2.4, LPL staff 5, LPL guest 2.4, LPL guest 5. And the reason for that is they have a password encrypted Wi-Fi service for the staff to use, and then they're using the guest network um, for the public. And a lot of the routers automatically will prioritize between what you said is the encrypted staff network and the open public guest network. Um, they will block guest devices that are using too much bandwidth or they'll slow them down, they'll throttle them um, to make sure that the, the staff devices are getting the connectivity they need to do what ne they need to get done. Um, a lot of those routers also have what they call an isolation feature on the guest network. That's a little box that you check on and off. And that's great for security. What that does is if you have the guest network enabled, and you have isolation enabled or whatever your router uses for that term, what that does is that device can only use the internet connection. It does not allow it to communicate with anything else on the network. So if somebody came in, got in your guest network, hoping that they would then be able to, you know, reach out and maybe hack some of the other devices, get access to a file server or something like that, that isolation feature blocks all that. It only allows that device to use the internet uh, connection and get out to the internet. It blocks all that. It's a great security feature. The only issue is it because it's doing that, if you have somebody that comes in on their phone and they're on the guest network and you have it enabled, 
they can't see any printers. Um, if you have a meeting room with a TV that people can screencast to, they can't see it, they can't see anything because of isolation. So again, it would depend on how your community utilizes the Wi-Fi network and what you want them to be able to do, whether you'd want to turn that feature or not. Printing's kind of the hot app anymore these days, so you may or may not want to do that. Um, some libraries you may say, hey, you need to log into one of our computers and then go to your email to be able to print. Some mm -hmm. libraries may say, oh, you'll need to be on our secured network. Here's our Wi-Fi password so you can connect to it and see the printers. And if you're changing your password on a regular basis, okay, so they have our Wi-Fi password, but we're going to change it at the end of the month or we're going to change it next week. So it's not that big a deal. What usually worked for me as a librarian is people would come in, they want to print something off, they have no idea how to do it, they have no idea how to connect to a printer on their smartphone. Yeah. What I generally would offer is, hey, here's my email address. If you want to email me the document, I'll print it for you, and then I'll show you that I've deleted it once I have it printed for you. And I did that probably nine times out of ten for folks and would get them their document and get them on their way. So again, it just depends. Just quicker um, and easier to yeah, do it for what's them. the quickest and easiest way to meet their need and get them on their way mm -hmm. um, i'm a big fan of having the wi-fi the guest wi-fi enabled so people outside the library that don't have a password connect to it um, i'm a big fan of the isolation feature just for the security it provides but again you've got a lot of people coming in um, printing from their own device or something um, it can be kind of problematic. So it just depends on what works best for you. Uh, WAP 3, we'll talk a little bit about that. So again, WAP 2 was the old security standard. WAP 3 is a new security standard. And again, this kind of does away with the need to have the Wi-Fi password. Um, WAP 3, obviously we don't have a lot of devices out in the wild that can actually utilize it yet. But WAP3 actually provides secure open network connection. So if you're able to utilize WAP3 security, um, it will create an encrypted connection for that device without a password requirement, which is the other thing why the security people are so excited about Wi-Fi 6E, Wi-Fi 7, and WAP3, is it, it, it plugs a lot of the security holes we've been dealing with for a long, long time um, from WAP2. So that's going to take a while really to kind of come in fruition just for the fact, you know, your community would all need to have the latest and greatest devices to take advantage of it. So down the road, it's definitely something to think of. Um, there's going to be a lot of businesses that are going to be moving to Wi-Fi 7 just to take advantage of the WAP 3 security. And they're going to obviously they have the funds to upgrade all their network stuff and they probably have the clout to tell their employees hey, if you want to use your personal phone on the Wi-Fi network, you're going to have to go get a new phone that does WAP3. And that's the rule they'll make, and they can get away with it because, you know, that's the business and that's what they want to do. Um, another feature that I don't think a lot of people are aware of that we've utilized, I utilized at my libraries, was there's a schedule feature where you can limit the availability of the Wi-Fi network by weekday, and by time window. So for example, in Sydney, when I, at the city council, let them know that we were going to be greatly improving our Wi-Fi network and the advantage to do so, uh, my police chief took issue with making it available 24 seven. Um, his concern was if that Wi-Fi available was 24 seven, uh, we would have people sitting out in front of the library at two in the morning, three in the morning, um, using the Wi-Fi, and if they're sitting in front of a library in the middle of the night, his immediate assumptions are probably up to no good. Or it would be an area where people would congregate because of the Wi-Fi availability, and that would cause us issues. Mm -hmm. So per our police chief's input, we limited the Wi-Fi availability. It was available every weekday, and we shut it off at uh, 10 p.m., and we didn't turn it back on until 6 a.m. to sidestep those issues. So be aware of that. That's something that can be um, super, super nice to use too. Um, if your library is not doing filtering, um, people who can connect to the library's network 
can then use it to, you know, maybe we do or don't care, you know, they're, maybe they're viewing kind of nasty stuff, things like that. What we do care about is if they're using the library's network to listen to pirated music or to watch pirated movies. Um, right. What can happen is the library can get a letter, and it used to come from like the MPA or the RIAA, where they're saying, hey, your network IP address is being used to download illegal content. We're going to fine you $10,000, and yeah. you need to fix it. So that was the old days. I was at a library. We got one of those letters. Um, so we did, a, I had a firewall that I was able to go in and put a rule in that wouldn't allow that um, file protocol that's widely used by pirate sites um, to work. Uh, but this is where limiting your availability can help out too. Where, you know, if people are using your Wi Fi network after hours after the library's closed, um, you can say, hey, you know, we're going to shut. You may tie your, your network to the library hours. So when the library closes at 7 p.m., 8 p.m., the Wi Fi network goes away too. Um, so if people are at home and they're using it to use their Netflix, to use their Macs, to use their Disney, um, to, to access content that's pirated, um, that's a, again a way to limit and have some control over that. Which gets us kind of the last thing is you can actually log into your router and you can look at who, what, when is using your Wi-Fi network. Um, Wi-Fi routers have what we call DHCP, and that's when you connect to the network. Um, the device gives the uh, the router gives the device. Here's all the information you need to use our network, and here's an IP address. And you can what they do then is they lease that um, IP address to that device for a period of time you can designate. So a lot of routers default it to 24 hours. Most of them you can change it. If you're ever into places where, like if you're in an airport, you can use your phone when you're first sitting down waiting for your plane, and then maybe an hour later you get your phone out, put your book down, get your phone out, and you have to reconnect to the Wi-Fi network again. They're limiting that lease time to just an hour or two to make it as available as possible because of how many people they have in the in the airport or wherever you're at. Um, so that's kind of the purpose of that. So that's something, again, the library can do. You can limit DHCP leases mm -hmm. to two hours. 24 hours is a good good number. Um, some places let it go longer. But what you can also do is you can go look at those DHCP leases and you can see how many non-library devices are using your network. It's a good metric, good idea of how many devices are using your network. You know, is our router good enough when I look at the documentation my for routers that they say it's best for 10 devices, 15 devices, 20 devices, that router, that DHCP lease will give you a count. Um, some routers have some really nice networking um, reporting kind of baked into them where you can just say, hey, show me my usage, give me the report on usage on my Wi-Fi network, and it'll show you some really nice reports on how your Wi-Fi network's being used. The other nice thing is if you have that ability to get in the router. The routers also have the ability where you can block devices. So this kind of comes into the parental controls that a lot of routers have, the idea of being used for home use, where you can set a schedule, your kids can't use the Wi-Fi, you know, when they should be in bed. Um, you can block devices. So let's say um, your kid did something, you want to ground them and cut them off from the Wi-Fi, you can block their devices on the Wi-Fi. So you and the rest of the family could still use it, but their devices are blocked until you know their one week suspension or something like that is up. If you're a library and you have a building next door and you go in and look and you can see you've got Roku's, uh, Fire Sticks, Google TVs, Apple TVs that are using your Wi-Fi network to, um, obviously they're using it to, to watch movies and stuff. And if you have one that's doing it all the time and sucking up a lot of your bandwidth, you can go in and block that device so it can't can't do that anymore. So this all comes down to my last bullet point at the bottom. Every library needs to have admin access login for all their technology and have it documented. Um, you should have the admin access to your router, 
um, or if it's a router modem provided by your ISP, you should have the admin access it to be able to get into it, set your rules, do what you want to do, look at the devices that are using it. Um, I have run at ISPs that do not permit their customers to have that. It's it's just a, a big issue to not have it. Um, if your ISP is like, you can't do that, then I would, you know, what are my options for having my own modem or router so I have that access, so I have that kind of control um, over my network and my security. So I yeah. highly, highly recommend it. Um, this is something that if you want to take advantage of, um, say, the DNS filter that we offer here at the Nebraska Library Commission right. for E-rate compliance and stuff, if I have, if you have the admin access login, you can share with me. I can go into your router. I can set it all up really quick and easy. Um, if we have to get your ISP involved because they won't let you have it, we can do that. I can provide them the information they need. But if we would need to make a change or something, we're dependent on one of their techs, you know, being available to do it. And a lot of the ISPs, because what you, you know, you're paying for that support as part of your internet service. You know, but could you run into one or if you have an outside IT company that has that and they won't share it with you and you have to pay them an hourly rate to do anything? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it just really, 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 it's something that you should have that admin access to those devices that your library is utilizing. Um, whether you want to manage some of the stuff yourself, um, just want to be able to pop in and look at stuff, uh, it's, it's just so valuable to have. I, I can it should have that, that yeah kind of in-house control and then you understand it a little better too and I know we have many libraries who are single person or very small staff and they don't think I can't keep up with all of this but um, that's why we have Sherm now he can help you figure all this out that is part of his job is reaching out to you all and helping yeah. you if you don't have your own IT person or if you do want to have a little bit more control and knowledge and not have to be like you said dependent on the ISP um, with the system that we have for the open DNS, uh, we can help you do that and Sherm can help you with all of your other keeping track of yeah. things. Yeah. And so a, a good ex another good example for having that level of access, you know, when we do the survey every year, we'll ask you how many devices I believe are using your Wi-Fi network. If you have the ability to go in and look at your DHCP leases and stuff, it makes it very easy to kind of extrapolate that to how much Wi-Fi network, how much use your Wi-Fi network gets over a year's time. And it's a great number to have. So if you're at your, you know, your city council meeting for budget time and stuff, being able to stay the bit, you know, tell the, the city council, you know, we have 60 people using our Wi-Fi network a day or a week. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it's super, super great information to have. If it's something, you know, you need my assistance to, to show you how to do it, or maybe once a year you want me to help you pull that number out. So when you're completing the survey, it's again, it's something we can assist you, but we have to have that admin login to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much all I have. Um, did we have any questions? Uh, let's see, nothing has come in yet while you were talking, Sherm. That's fine. Does anybody have any questions you want to ask? Um, so this has been really great. Lots lots of information here, obviously, for everyone, I'm sure. Um, uh, some things yeah. you may have not known about, not thought about before. Uh, and as I said questions? before, we're in kind of the big transition phase here now. So the 6 mm -hmm. gigahertz frequency is out. Um, the WAP3 new security protocol is out, so we're kind of in a big shift that's going to start this year um, with the devices. Yeah, so this, like you said, that's why you said you want to do this now. There's big changes coming that everyone needs to be aware of and figure out how, what you want, what you need to do to um, to be able to use them, to can comply with them, and have things that you're you're actually getting the internet service you're paying for <laughs> to your devices and yeah. to your and it place back let's say you're looking at buying new computers um, make sure those new computers if they have Wi-Fi built into them support Wi-Fi 7 you know if they don't then maybe you want to hold off a little bit um, until the devices that are available um, to support the new standards so you know if you're gonna buy new computers and you're gonna get a new router you know you've got all the latest and greatest and kind of did a little future proofing there for your stuff yeah. 
Um, we do have one question that came. If anybody has any questions, type in the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, we are um, a we're a little after 11 o'clock, but that's okay. Um, I should have jumped in earlier, but I was just listening. <laughs> um, we um, Whatever questions you have, we'll go until you get them all answered today. If you don't have a chance right now, you can always reach out to Sherm. There is his contact info as well. And this full recording will be available along with the slides for you to have access to probably by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, I'll get all of that posted up. Um, we do have a question that says, Sherm, what did you say is the best um, WAM is from? W-A-M? WAM. I don't know. The WAM, W-A-N. That's yeah. the wide area network. So that's that your good internet yeah, yeah. And it comes right. from your... ISP. So depending on what kind of service you have, your ISP will do what we call the handoff to you. So in the days with DSL and cable, you have a DSL or cable modem. That you meant WAP, wireless access point. Oh, Sorry. wireless access point. So those are called WAPs and WAPs. they've been around for a yes, while um, in really in use in large buildings and large businesses. Um, when I was with Budweiser, we had WAPs through our warehouse because we used handheld devices uh, throughout the warehouse. Uh, they used to be expensive. Um, and like I said, they've really come down to very simple. The ubiquity ones are available for like 100 bucks. They do make outdoor ones too that are waterproof for just a little money more. And mm -hmm. I see those all over the place now. So if you walk into a business or a coffee shop or a library and you see that white disc on the ceiling with kind of the blue ring glowing around it, that's mm -hmm. like the standard. That's what almost all everybody has these days. And what's nice of those, as we talked about with the ethernet connection and the power over ethernet, you can place those anywhere. So yeah. if you've got a basement meeting room, you can hang one of those in the middle of the, your ceiling in the, in the meeting room. Um, if it's, they do make wall mounts, so if you want to have it just kind of hang on the wall and then it extends out, so because they're made to hang um, flat. Let me flip back to that picture. Yeah, you had some pictures of that, yeah. So Ubiquiti would be the um, brand to look for. Yeah. Let me get back to that. So this WAP here, the ubiquity, that's um, that's like the standard. And during the pandemic, they got really hard to find because of all the shortages and stuff we're having. Uh, they're readily becoming available again. And this this tends to be the standard. Um, a lot of your, your routers um, have the ability. So if you have a router from TP-Link or Linksys, have the ability to put them into a WAP mode where you can use, maybe if you have your router's not super old and it's a Linksys and you buy a new Linksys and your old Linksys has the ability to support their implementation of WAP, you might be able to turn your old router into an access point rather than purchase something new. But like I said, these ubiquity ones, and they're made to hang from the ceiling and the way they're built is they're broadcasting out in a circle um, from that device. So I've been in the libraries where somebody's just stuck one on the wall, so it's not really broadcasting the way it's meant to, um, or they've got it um, stuck in a desk or something somewhere. They're meant to be out line of sight to get the best possible connection and stuff. So and like I said, I think thinking of it, go, they're around, think of it as that, that's, it, it's gonna be around coming yeah, out from that point, yeah. They're made, they're designed to be a circular antenna. So if you look at the Wi-Fi router up above, those four antennas coming up from it, they have, mm -hmm. they're have they flexible, so you can kind of move them around and adjust them mm -hmm. to, to beam your service where you want it to go. Those WAPs are made to just beam out in a circle, and they have mm -hmm. a limited amount of range. So depending on the square feet of your library, maybe you have one at each end of the library, maybe mm -hmm. you have one in the middle, and one in the meeting room and maybe an outdoor one that that beams wi-fi to the park next door or something like that it just really depends on your setup and you know mm -hmm. i can definitely assist with that on yes. what we think is going to be the best way to go yeah and he wants to clarify he would need that um that injector there the um, yeah so those are made to be powered switch. over ethernet so then you have to have either a switch with poe ports if you have an older switch that is one gig throughput, 
you can buy those POE injectors. They're only like 15 bucks a piece. And you can use that then to inject power into the ethernet connection um, mm -hmm. to your WAP. So you may be able to get a switch that would handle on its own, but if not, you can get an injector. Right, so if you're looking at having to buy a new switch and you have, especially if you have voice over IP telephones and security cameras, you'd buy a switch where all the ports have PE, POE also, and you just plug them in and they feed power to your WAP, to your phone, to your security camera. So, so check the so stats forth. on a switch, a new switch you might buy, and you just need that, it would work fine. Right, sure and then depending, really. like if you're going to be using it for security cameras, you'll probably need a switch that's got the highest power feed rating to feed power to those. And it doesn't matter if you've got, so you bought a switch that's got POE ports that put out this much power, which is more than what your WAP or your phone needs, that's fine. They'll only take what they need but you need to make sure it's scaled to meet the biggest power requirement, which right now tends to be those security cameras. Yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, let's, let's try and uh, let's see if anybody has, oh, got, thank you, Krista, thank you, Sherm, yeah. Does anybody have any other last minute desperate questions you want to ask of Sherm before we wrap things up this morning? You can type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, there is also his contact info, which you can always find on our website as well, but there it is on the slide. Um, I'm waiting to see if anything comes up. I'll say, as like I said, um, we will be processing the recording of today's show. Um, by the end of the day, tomorrow, it'll be posted um, along with the slides. Sherm's already sent me his slides, so you have access to these with all of the info and the pictures and the, and the links and everything. Um, everyone who registered for and um, attended today's show will get an email directly from me. But then after, and then I will also push it out onto our various social media. We have a mailing list for Nebraska for our libraries, and then um, Twitter and Facebook that we use as well. I don't think anything else, see anything else coming in. So I'm going to pull back to my screen just to show you where you'll get all of this info too. And, you know, if you're a library that doesn't have an IT person or the IT skill set, I am happy to um, do a technology audit. A lot of times we yes. can just do that with pictures. If you can shoot me pictures of the router and the switch and the modem you have, I can tell you how old it is, what it can and can't do, uh, should it be upgraded, and I can even give you some links to some stuff on Amazon that would be, here's what I would you know, recommend for your situation. Again, yep. we have the ability to provide funding assistance. Yes to purchase new yeah. stuff. Um, I have made multiple trips out to libraries to actually do the upgrade on the router and the switch and mm -hmm. anything else that needs to be done at no charge to the library. So I'm here to help, just reach yeah. out. Yeah, definitely reach out to us. I know a lot of libraries are, this is one thing that you sometimes don't think about when you're, you, know, you hear all about update your fibers, you know, increase your fiber speed, and that's great. But if you don't have the equipment that can handle it and it, it's a waste of money. <laughs> yeah, and I've, so. we, I've seen that a lot with the fiber libraries I work where they're going to, um, you know, 200 megabit, 300 megabit fiber service, but they have an old switch that can't run any faster than 100 megabit. Yeah. Um, so you've just spent a bunch of money and you can never run any faster. So really you got to make sure that your internal network can support the speed of the internet connection you're you're upgrading to. Yep, absolutely. And you can do that either with E-Ray or with direct funding from us or for, with grant funding that you can get. Lots of different ways. Yeah, um, Lots of options to do it. All right. So um, if you use whatever is your search engine of choice and type in um, Encompass Live, you'll come up with our website and our archive page. These are upcoming shows for the rest of this month. Um, and I've got oh, I have some for March. I've got to get filled in here, too. Um, We'll get them added. Uh, but our archive shows are here. There's a link right here to our archives, the most recent ones on the top of the page here. I was, I've was i been out until today, so last week's isn't here yet, but it will be up. I'll, I'll be getting that up um, today and tomorrow. And then today's show will be here too. Um, there'll be, as I said, a link to the recording, which goes onto our, the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel, and then a link to the slides in our SlideShare account that you will all have access to. Um, as I said, we will post that also out to our social media. We do have links to that. You'll see we have a Facebook page for our Encompass Live show. So if you'd like to use Facebook, give us a like. <laughs> and you'll be notified when things are coming up. Here's your reminder to log into today's show, announcement about today's show, um, last week's show, and then 
previous one, um, there's a recording from the one before, so you'll see that out there. Um, we also posted up that the Library Commission has um, Twitter account and um, Instagram as well. You'll see some announcements, and we always use the hashtag, little abbreviation, NCUMP Live, a little abbreviation of our name whenever we post anything that's related to the show. So if you keep looking for that, um, you will keep up to, thing, up to date on things as well. All right, so thank you everybody for being here. Thank you so much, Sherm. This is great. Lots of awesome information. Hopefully you'll have lots of libraries reaching out to you soon. I hope so. Like I said, it's we're in a big transition period now. So, yeah. so you need to get on top of this. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. making sure you're getting value for the um, valuable dollars you want to spend to yeah, definitely. get on the current bandwagon. So you don't want to be wasting your money, no. All right, thank you. So um, that's it for today. I hope you'll join us next week when we're talking about Connected Nebraska, bridging the, bridging the digital divide through innovative Edurome expansion. Um, a few years ago, we had um, Brett Bieber on to talk about this. Is something done through the University of Nebraska, um, Internet, um, Nebraska Statewide Education Network. Um, for K-12 schools, colleges, and libraries. So um, he will um, give us an update on that. So please do sign up for that if you're interested or any of our other upcoming shows. And keep an eye on this page as I start adding in our um, March topics as well. All right, that's it for today then. Thank you all, and we'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.